for the families of the children who died tragically in Naledi from suspected food poisoning are still waiting for toxicology results to confirm what actually caused their deaths. But how long do these investigations typically take and how easy is it to actually establish a direct link? For that, let's bring in toxicologist Dr. Gerard Ferduren, who's with us now via our video link. Dr. Ferduren, thanks very much indeed for your time and patience. Welcome to the SABC. Perhaps we can just start by understanding what goes typically into the process of conducting these toxicology tests, because in this particular instance, I'm not even sure if the families or investigators were able to get samples of what these kids allegedly ate. Well, one would actually start off with the deceased, in other words, with a post-mortem analysis conducted by the pathologist. They would need to take some examples, and those would have to be submitted then to the forensic laboratory. So there are two things that they would need to do with those samples. First of all, they would have to go and test for any bacterial toxins, in other words, the typical clostridium or salmonella that's implicated mostly in food poisoning in South Africa or actually all around the world. But more importantly for me is to go and detect whether there are any pesticides in that food because I am not convinced about the fact that this is actually a typical food poisoning. It sounds to me more like poison that was in the food. In other words, um, an agrochemical or a pesticide that we talk in the normal sense. So that is what needs to be done for the post-mortem. And secondly, then, is to do proper interrogation of the parents to find out what the children ate where they buy those particular foodstuffs to go back to those sources of the foodstuff and investigate what happened in that particular vendor shop or in the spa shop or maybe at the street vendor. Because what we find in the country is that um, the conditions at these retailers or these spa shops and the street vendors are very appalling. And very often they sell typical foodstuff that children eat, like biscuits or candies or these little popsicles and stuff like that in between pesticides, which are illegal pesticides. They're not registered. They're actually very, very toxic. And they sell them in between the candies and all these biscuits that kids eat. And if there's any mishap there, like a packet breaking or a bottle spilling over, the food stuff the children eat in good faith will actually be poisoned by the pesticide. And I believe that these children were poisoned by a pesticide. It wasn't a typical food poisoning, because with food poisoning, you seldom, if ever, get a patient passing away. Whereas with what we see in the couple of last couple of months or the year, actually, is that with cases where suspected food poisoning turned into total mortality of all the patients. So it tells me it was actually a pesticide and not uh, actually the typical food poisoning caused by bacteria. Mm. That's interesting because we've already heard some of the people who sell in that community saying that, in fact, you know, as far as they're concerned, their stuff is above board. In fact, one of them went as far as to say that they, too, consume that food. And so the insinuation there is that it wouldn't necessarily be uh, contain any toxins. My question is, um, how easy is it to create a direct link in a context where, of course, you know, the facts are being contested, which is the case in this instance? Well, the retailer will, will sell them if ever come up with a true fact, because now the retailer is implicated in the death of the children. But what I've seen myself going out with the police and the metro people and agriculture department into many of these part of shops and street vendors is, like I said, they sell the street pesticides, the unlawful pesticides, in between all of the foodstuffs. And um, people buy the foodstuffs, like, like they might buy a packet of noodles or they might buy open biscuits or a packet of open uh, crisps. And alongside with that, they will buy a street pesticide. And in that bag, there can be contamination. When they get home, they leave those street pesticides in the open. The children have access to it. And in some cases, we've even had um, stories where people think that the black granules, which is aldicarb, is actually black pepper, and they use it on the food as a, as a condiment for the food. And that leads then to the certain poisoning and the possible death of the people. Um, I just don't believe that it is food poisoning. And it is very simple to get poisoned because there is a lack of control over these unlawful poisons into the country, literally by the tons every month from foreign countries, by foreign nationals bring it in. It's sold to people who have no idea what they're buying from the street vendors and from the spa shop. The spa shop sell it unlawfully. It's in between the food stuff, not like in a typical store where you walk in, where you've got your owl with your detergents, you've got your owl with your home and garden pesticides, you've got your owl with a proper packaged food. 
these are informal. So there's no proper control over separation of toxins versus the food. And it can happen at the level of the vendor. It can happen in the package that's being taken home. It can happen at the home itself. And unfortunately, there are some implications also where some of the foodstuffs are del deliberately laced with the pesticide. And I don't know why it happens because we had a case in Port Elizabeth where three kids died after eating noodles that were laced with turbifast. And they didn't last two hours before they died in the hospital. And sadly, it is always the poor people. So the poor people are at the brunt of this illegal activity. And it's actually horrific for me to hear that there are more and more in cases of kids and young people dying because of these types of poisoning. And it all goes back to a lawless society where the authorities, I don't think, have control over it. And I don't blame them because they are under severe stress with all the the crime we've got to deal with, but somehow we've got to get to the grip of it because it's unacceptable for me as a toxicologist and organic chemist to hear every day of more and more people being poisoned to the point of fatality. Food poisoning can go because we all know that people buy food which is off, you get sick, you get nauseous, you get vomiting, but you all recover. But what we see now is most definitely a severe situation that I think the government must take control of and sort out because it's unacceptable. Absolutely. How long um, do these tests typically take? If the laboratory is um, geared up with all the equipment, and most laboratories have good equipment, uh, including the state, and they've got good technologists, doesn't matter whether you work for the state or for private, or for the police or for the typical forensic laboratories, if they do have to do the culturing for finding out whether the bacteria are there, that would take anything from four to possibly seven days. If they have to do analysis for any pesticide poisons or any other poisons, that should take no longer than seven days. So if they speed up the process, and I do believe in a case like this where five children died, they need to speed up the process. We should be able to get an answer from the laboratory within seven days what the chemical was or what the biological chemical was that caused the poison, because it can either be a biological substance like, for example, a bacterium, or it can be a chemical toxin, like I mentioned, aldicarb or turbifos or diclofos or methamethophos. These are the ones which are mostly implicated, but it shouldn't take longer than a week to 10 days to get those results out of the laboratory. All right. I suppose in some ways they're still within that window because my next question was going to be whether or not in this particular case we're taking longer than we should. But if you say up to 10 days, then I suppose we should know by the end of this week what actually may have led to those deaths. Uh, Dr. Ferdurin, let me thank you for your time and your insight. Really do appreciate you speaking to us. Dr. Gerald Ferdurin is a toxicologist.